All right, if we could stand up and greet the person next to you, you guys can greet yourselves. I know it's a little early, so hopefully we can liven up a little bit, shake off. I know it's 10.30, get ready. School starts tomorrow for some of you. Sorry, it's just you, I guess. <laughs> Nobody else cried. Good. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. And we'll leave us in.
to introduce uh, Taufik to share with us a, a short reflection this morning. Taufik. Good morning, everyone. I thought I'd open up real quick in a word of prayer. So, if you bow your heads. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this time together. I thank you for the, the time we get to spend together this morning uh, in going through your word and doing worship and, and then uh, having the message afterwards. I just thank you for this, and I just pray for the rest of our day and the rest of our week that you'd be able to bless it and, and help us to learn from the, the things that we're able to share up here. In your name I pray. Amen. So today I wanted to, I wanted to talk about a topic that I think it's been very near and dear to my heart, uh, especially that I've been traveling a lot recently. So that is the, the topic of hospitality. So I wanted to start off with a verse. So this is in Matthew twenty five thirty five. if you want to follow along. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. So I think something that I took for granted a lot before I started a lot of my travels and going and seeing new places and meeting new people was that you always have these needs taken care of, but more importantly, you always have the need, that last part, that I was a stranger, you invited me in. And I think the, the more and more I kind of look back on this past year, the more and more I realized how important it is to be able to reach out to the stranger. And so if you can go uh, to the next slide, Philip, thank you. So I know that in, so in our lives now, we know that hospitality and friendship is needed more than ever. So if you look, uh, even statistics show, even with all of the social media we have, all of the communication, people are still really lonely. And, uh, and it's just really important to reach out to them because we, we might have, so just like it says in the verse, just like David mentioned, that we might have, have God and Jesus to follow along with us whenever we're going through, through dark times and through quiet times. Um, others that might not have that. So I wanted to give a, a quick story of something that was on my heart that, uh, that really touched me as I finished up uh, working out in California recently. So there was, there's plenty of opportunities to meet people, but as, as many of you know, if, if you have your day-to-day -day routine, whether it's in school or whether it's at work, you get busy. And you go from rush from meeting to meeting or from class to class or whatever it might be. But you never really take the time to say hi to people. And so there was, there was one person during my time, during my travels, that, that really stood out. And that was, uh, it was a gentleman who was the front desk security guy at the, at the building we'd go to every week. And so we just say hi to him, say bye to him. And a couple of times we actually uh, stopped by and got a little bit of his story, got to hear from him. And it was just amazing how every time we'd walk by and, and see him any time going forward after listening to his story, how he just, his face would light up and he'd just be so excited and happy. And I think it's something to be said about how in the early church, like if you look at the stories of the different people, they, they'd go out and they'd, they'd reach out to people and listen to them. So um, I can tell you what happened with the story later after, after I finish up, but it's just amazing how some of these people, you just never know what kind of an impact it might have and, and kind of how that opens up an opportunity to share. So that, that same gentleman, we, we would have a Bible study at work before we'd start, so we'd have it early in the morning, and he'd be the only one probably in the building whenever we'd come in. So he'd see us, and he finally started asking, he said, you know, what are you guys doing this morning? Like, what are you doing? And so we'd have a Bible study. We'd have a Bible study once a week. So he knew about that. Um, but we didn't really get to share a whole lot with him. But then, uh, come to find out, my, my actual my last day out there, he, uh, we went and we were talking, trying to find him to say bye. And it turned out he, he had passed away that week from heat stroke. And this is a guy in his early 20s. And so it's just, I thought it was really amazing how 
you never know when you get an opportunity to talk to people and you get a chance to share with them. And so it's, it's even in those like little situations, just reaching out to whoever it might be. It might be the person that you meet once here, talk to there. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of hospitality in the church uh, that we kind of learned from the Bible. So uh, I want to start first with Hebrews, so Hebrews 13. Uh, Do not neglect or show, to ho- show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So, and I think this is important because if you look throughout the Old Testament, it's, it's just amazing how, how much of an impact it has to, to show hospitality. I know I was, um, it, it affected me whenever I heard uh, Amo John's message a couple weeks ago that he talked about hospitality. And I think I wanted to kind of take it further to a lot of the young people here because I know we might not be able to host people in our homes to do things, but it's just, it's the little things of being able to reach out to others around us and being able to show them love and hospitality. So, even in the little things, whether it's if you're, uh, if you're at school or you're traveling, just saying hi to someone. Ask them if they want to just grab a quick lunch. Even if they don't want to do that, just seeing how they've been doing. Uh, in the church, that's, I think that's really the thing that attracts people to the church and what it is. Because otherwise, it's just really hard to reach out to people, especially once you finish up school and you go out to the working world. It's really what sets you apart from others. It's the fact that you care about them and you want to hear about their stories and see what they want to do in life. So... The last part I wanted to talk uh, in hospitality. So in Timothy, he's talking about a good deacon leader in the church and some of the key, I guess the key attributes that they have to have. And one of them is hospitality. They have to be a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And I thought it was really interesting how, how he started out that it's a, it's a long chain. It keeps going on that chain of, of different attributes. And it starts out with hospitality. And so that's, that's really interesting that in order to, to really have a successful church, you have to be welcoming and, and welcoming to those who come in new um, and are coming and searching. So that being said, I just want to close out with one more verse. So and this is also Jesus in that same passage that we started out with, just to close it off. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And I just pray that um, we just remember that no matter who we're, we're working with or talking to or... Uh, or reaching out with, it's, it's not only the, the situations that we might think go within our lives, but sometimes it's just stepping back from our normal routine and in the normal lives uh, and talking to the folks who just need to be talked to. And, and you, can, you can tell from just your day-to-day routines and lives, you can see people's eyes and you can kind of tell, you know, I need to, I need to reach out to them, I need to encourage them. So just pray for that, that we'd be able to, to look at that and in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to kind of practice that in our, in our day-to-day routines. So thank you.
Please take a seat. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our pastor, Dr. Isam Rad, and my dad to come talk on Daniel this morning. So, let's welcome him. I want to thank you again, thank the choir, the great job that you are doing. It's wonderful. It's, it's, a, it's a worship time for me, and I, I really get blessed when I'm with you. And I want to thank uh, Taufik for, for the good message, the great message. Thank you, Taufik. And Dan now on the, on the drums, a good job. The people who are in the choir, just wonderful. Uh, so uh, uh, very thankful to you. Now, I, I think I'm going to read some passages. I don't know if there are some volunteers who would like to read uh, from Daniel this morning. Any volunteers? And some, perfect. So if you can read for us, that would be good. Actually, I have it here. Would you like to, to read? Or I can maybe give it to you and just... Uh, uh, this is the passage. If you can read this passage for us. Yes, yes. And, uh, right, sure. Yes, please. Daniel 6. 13 through, 20, uh, 13 through 16. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes this petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set in his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the angel till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning, concerning Daniel might not be changed. Yes, yes. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I, have, I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. Amen. Well, Sarah, you have the, uh, the character of Daniel. You're ready, always ready to serve and stand in the gap. I want to thank the Lord for you. But you know, the story of Daniel sometimes is presented to us like a kid's story, like a nice kind of fairy tale. We've seen it, we've seen the picture. Uh, Daniel is in the uh, lion's den and the way, but, but it's so relevant for us. And it's a real story that has happened in time and space uh, where one man or few men with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego changed the uh, history. They really literally changed, like the disciples, changed history in one of the two great empires. One of them is the Babylonian Empire, and the second one is the Persian. Daniel chapter 1 starts with these verses, with one verse that really kind of moves you and gives you an idea of who Daniel is. And what are the decisions, gives you an idea of what were the decisions in his life that made Daniel defeat the lion in his den. So the story that we read in chapter 6 at the end of his life when he was around 85 years old starts early when he was 18 years old, a young man who was taken as a prisoner, as captive. Now imagine they were taken by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were brutal. 
I mean, you're talking about ISIS now and all of this. They were brutal. They were the same thing. They took them as prisoners, as the people of God, from Jerusalem, and he was belonged to nobility, and all of a sudden he finds himself as a prisoner. But then you find some great decisions that he made, and these are the decisions that led for him to defeat the enemy, to defeat the lion. And here the lion is, is, is symbolic, although this has happened, is the, there was a physical lion, but behind that was the spiritual lion, who roars basically to destroy us, who is Satan. And, and he is a prototype of Christ. So let's go back to chapter 1 and, and, and see sort of what has happened. What has happened is these young men, they were, were, were captured. He was probably around 17 years old and taken by Nebuchadnezzar and, and the kind of the Babylonians as captive. And they were made to serve there. And they were sort of put them into a school to kind of serve the king. And they found that they were very bright, and they wanted them to be part of the wise men, the hukama. So they, they tried to kind of give them uh, and put, uh, put them through certain tests. But it says that there is something that has happened there for them. They, 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 had to, they made them change their names. They certainly forced them to uh, change. They, they, it was a foreign language for them, so they had to learn a totally the Assyrian now or the kind of Babylonian language. They had to change their culture. They had to change their food. They had to change everything in them. Actually, it says that the, the kind of head of the group was the Enoch. So, so it, it was like they were, they were really captive. Everything they, was for them new. It's like you're being taken captive in a place in, in, in the Far East, in China or Vietnam, where you don't understand the language, and, uh, or, or even in the Middle East, and you don't understand what's going on. But it says in the midst of all of this that Daniel... Daniel took a stand, and Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king, king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the Enox that he might not defile himself. Now listen, I just want to explain that to you. What he's basically telling them is, okay, you, you, you took everything from me. You took everything from us our possessions, our position as nobility, our money, our everything. And you, you, took, you took even our language, you took our culture, the way we eat, the way we dress. Even our names had to be changed. Even the name had to be changed. His original name is Daniel, but they gave him another name, which is Assyrian. But you cannot take that one thing from us, our worship of the living God in our heart. And the fact that we worship a living and holy God and we're going to not be defiled by anything that you kind of present to us, by all the delicacies. And you know what the delicacies is? Is the kind of all, all the kind of passions around them, all what pleases the appetites. Now, somebody has said that Satan does not come to you with, you know, big horns and uh, uh, with a big red tail and, you know, huge, uh, large teeth to kind of devour you. No, no, he, he comes with things that really appeal to the, your inner basic desires, the desires of the, of, the, of the human nature. And I think what made Daniel great, what made Daniel, who he is, a great man that you see it all through, is the first decision, if I can have the kind of first slide here, the first decision that he has chosen, he has chosen holy character over human corruption. A holy character over human corruption. Or maybe we want to say it. He chose holy character over human comfort. In other words, he said, no, 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 you can eat all of these food. He said, no, no, no. According to us and our faith, there are certain things we don't eat. And you offer us wine? No, we don't drink wine because we're set for the Lord. And this is the kind of thing that the Lord is asking you now here. Now, no, no, there are no certain foods that you're prohibited from eating, but there are certain things that are not consisting with the holy character of Christ and the spirit of Christ who is in you. And this is the kind of character that makes you who you are, makes you Daniel-like, and makes you Christ-like, is that you're going to resist the tide around you and say, I want to have a holy Christ-like character that would overcome the human corruption around me. And even if it's at the expense of all the comforts that are given to me. So this morning, I'd like to kind of remind you of this kind of a, a big item for the young people and even for the old and the middle age and the old age and every, every age. Dare to be a Daniel. 
Build a character. Allow the Lord to build a character in you. By daily kind of allowing his spirit to take control of you, the Holy Spirit. And so that you'll have, you'll be able to kind of swim against the tide and sail against the wind. There is so much corruption around you. There is so much kind of peer pressure to, for the people around you to, to kind of mold your character according to them. And dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be Christ-like. And put the priority for a holy character. That I want to live a life that is above sin. And I don't want to be cool, but I want to be Christ-like. You understand? Like the idea, that everybody around us wants us to be, and be, we as Christians, we would love to kind of please others and be nice and kind, but not at the expense of being Christ-like. Yes, be kind. But don't choose to be cool if it's not going to be Christ-like. And you're going to find it, whether it's in high schools or universities or the workplace or any place that you, you go to. There is a pressure around you to choose between human corruption versus a holy character. And choose the, choose the second, choose the holy character for the sake of Christ. Beautiful story that I've read about uh, by, by Dan uh, Reynolds. He said when he went, they went to a minefield and... Uh, uh, as a preacher and a pastor, he was visiting a minefield, and somebody was a guide with him. And he, they, they went to all this coal mine, coal mine that is uh, dirty and all this, this dust and everything is black. You know, have you ever been to a coal mine? It's probably in the previous era. Now, sort of, we don't see it, but it's in the. But 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 when you go, he went and he saw this kind of white rose, beautiful white rose, and shiny white. And he told him, how can this white rose maintain that kind of beautiful whiteness in the midst of all this kind of black dust? And he said, well, try it for yourself. That other guy, the guy took some more coal, of that coal dust, and he put it on that kind of rose, and it slipped through its kind of uh, petals and the, whole, and the leaves, and it slipped through, and the kind of rose remained white. This is exactly what the Lord wants you to be. A shining star in the midst of the darkness. You can say no to all of this kind of looseness in terms of a sensuality and, and sort of a, uh, basically, adultery around you and pornography and all of this. Whether you're married or not married, you have to make a stand and choose a holy life because it's your life. The way of destruction is to live as, a, as a, a claiming to be a Christian, but living an up and down life with no kind of commitment to holiness. So I want to call on you for a life of heart holiness. Allow Christ to do that magnificent work on a daily basis and take courage, you're in a battlefield, to press forward. Stephen Dow said the gave that beautiful illustration. He said when they first started having these, uh, I don't know, I mean, it, 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 wasn't, uh, it wasn't during my, my time when I was a little kid. We used to be get so excited when we get these gifts, like you get a car or a train, and then, uh, and then you, you know, with the batteries inside, you sort of, uh, um, by remote control, you move it back and forth. And I used to get so excited. But during my times, you used to kind of bring them, and the thing has the little gift, like a little car, and it says, no batteries inside. So we used to be very disappointed, you know, kind of we used to tell our parents, you know, we can't go get us the batteries. You know, you're kind of on Christmas Eve, you really want to play with that car. And they said, well, okay, we'll get it next week, and I'll know the holidays. So, so finally, these kind of companies, they said, come on, these little kids are getting upset. And we want to sell more of those. So they made sure that these cars have batteries already in them. And so that whenever they open the gift, they can just, the thing has the power in it to move. And the same thing the Lord has done for us. He gave us the gift of eternal life, but he gave us with it the power to live a holy life. And that power is the spirit that is in you. I want to tell you with all my heart this morning that there is a Holy Spirit in you that is able to move not only your life, but nations around you. Don't underestimate that power that is in you. It says, for God is able to do exceedingly more than what even we pray and ask for according to the power that is in us. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a great power in you only if you comply with it. It's the power of the Spirit of Christ. 
that can change nations, that can move mountains, that is able to kind of really show you as a powerful Christ-like person. Don't underestimate that power. And that power resides in a holy life committed to avoid corruption. He put in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now the second one, the second choice, choice and decision is the second one is, wow, Daniel chose purity over possession. Now the second king after Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, you see, I, it's very difficult for me to pronounce his name in English. Belshazzar, you know, I don't know how to say it. This was the other king that came after. So he wanted him to prophesy for him because he had the gift of prophecy. And he brought him in and he told him, look, if you truly kind of prophesy for me, I am going to give you, a, you know, everything we have. And I'm going to put a chain of gold around your neck. It says in Daniel 5:17, I'll put a chain of gold around your neck and you shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Now, remember, now he started going up the ladder, and he started getting more promotions. <clears throat> and, 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 uh, but he said, I'll give you. I'll give you all of this wealth. And he said, look what the, answer, the way Daniel answered. Because he knew that he was a kind of vicious king. He said, Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. And, and he says, give rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. And he reads to him the writing on the wall. Now we say that use the term, the writing on the wall. We don't understand what it is. He read the writing on the wall that soon your demise will be near because you were an unjust king. So he gave the message. But you see how pure he is, how contented. Contentment over comfort. There's another thing. The purity over possessions. He said, I don't want anything else. I'm satisfied. I'm here to serve my Lord. Now, tell you this. Can the enemy bribe you? I don't know what it is. Maybe a better promotion at work. Maybe a, a you know, whatever thing. Can he bribe you in order to distract you from the priority of living a purely committed life to Christ? And he'll do everything. Even, even at the end, it doesn't have to be monetary thing. It doesn't have to be money. It could be other distractions. He will try to do anything so that he will distract you from giving all priority to Christ and living that kind of pure life. And some of us who start making income, they start kind of dying for the little more dollars, for a little bit more money on our paycheck at the expense of living a life for Christ or serving Christ, not Daniel. This is the great decision, the second decision that was decisive in winning the battle and defeating the enemy. I believe with all my heart. Oh, we're spoiled in this world. I have shared it with you before. 80% of the world population live on less than $10 per day. 80% of the population. They don't, cannot have a shower every day. They barely have a shower every week. 80% of the population who live less than $10 per day are either underfed or are hungry. Almost one billion people around the world are hungry. If you are in a place where you're having kind of a shower every day, and you're at least having two meals or more every day, then you're on the upper 20%, but we keep complaining. We're never contented with what we have. I was sharing last Friday, if we have the air condition here messed up in the, in the kind of uh, church, or we have, you know, the temperature's not working very well, everybody's complaining what's going on. Nobody can mean, but you go to the to, to kind of our homeland of origin, and there's no air condition whatsoever, and the temperature is much higher, and they have shelling over, you know, can somebody is throwing rockets at you, and they're shooting in the streets, and everybody's in church happy, praising the Lord, because we're not contented. We are living in a consumer society that keeps always making you feel that you need more, and you cannot live with the way you're living. And you have to have more, you have to have more. And there is no way you can be contented. And every, the same, same word that keeps coming up on the lips of everybody. It's not fair. I had somebody playing with uh, Sammy when he was uh, young, one of the kind of little kids in the neighborhood. And he, every time they play together, he says, it's not fair. It's not fair. Every time he loses, I told him, kid, life is not fair. You have to live and accept it. 
So I want to tell you this. Learn how to be content in the Lord. I'm not saying don't be ambitious. Aim high. But learn to live like a soldier. Learn to be contented with what you have and make the best of what, we, what you have for the sake of Christ. I loved it when the NBC morning reporter, Katie Khoury, it's not Khoury, Khoury, this is not uh, K, it's a C, it's a C-O-U-R-I. So, Joseph, not talking about your family. So it's the Khoury, C-O-R-I-E. And they asked, she was complaining and says, what kind of job? They told her, do you like your job? They're doing an interview with her. No, she, she does good morning, whatever it is, America or something. So she comes in, at, she starts at 7. She said, no, no, it's a terrible job. The workers work so hard. I said, what do you mean so hard? We start very, I have to go to bed at 8 or 8.30 in the evening. Why? Because we start very early. I have to be here in the kind of TV station at 5 o'clock in the morning. What kind of a life of this? It's not fair. And then somebody asked her, well, what's your annual salary? She said, well, it's okay. They search it out. It's $65 million per year. And she's complaining because she wakes up very early in the morning. Brother. <laughs> brother. Some people would be happy to have 65000 and wake that early, you know, per year, and wake up that early in the morning. So I want to tell you this. Don't let the society around you spoil you with that kind of life. Remember, you're a man or a woman on a mission. God has put you where you are to change and have a positive impact on the environment around you. God has put you in this church to be a servant. God has put you in this city to be a servant for his. And to shine like a star reflecting his glory. Number three, he chose prayer over promotion. Now, there came a time when they tried to plot against him. And they said, well, it's easy. We figured him out. We have nothing against figuring him out. Now, remember, this is now the time of the third king, which is the king of Persia, where Farhad and my, my dear sister are from there. So now the king of Persia, Darius, has Daniel in, and he has a council, a higher council of three prime ministers, and now Daniel is one of these three prime ministers, the big shots. They're leading the country. They're more than governors, by the way. Each one of them was a governor of the, of the big empire. Now, the whole, the, remember, Persia controlled the world. It was a world empire. All the known world at that time were under them, so these three men ruled the world. And he said, among these three prime ministers, the one who is the primest, if you may, was Daniel. And the other two were so jealous of him. They hated him. And they said, we can't find anything against him except the fact that he worships his God, the one God. And he prays for him three times. So in his absence, they got the other people kind of rulers under them and everything, and they went to the king, and so they they put a trap for the king, which really would kind of feed into his ego. They said, king, for 30 days, we want to find out who is loyal to you now. I said, okay. He said, for 30 days, we want to ask all the people here in the whole empire to worship only you. And anybody who worships any other god except you would be killed and would be thrown to the lions. Now, they knew that Daniel will not compromise on his god. And he prays for him three times per day. Can you imagine this? So what a, what a kind of a challenge. Now, look, come on. If you and I were in the place of Daniel, we would say, well, 30 days is not a long time. At least I'll do my devotions in my closet. At, you know, I won't tell anybody that I'm not wor- you know, worshiping my other God. I mean, God would understand. Imagine if somebody tells you now, for 30 days, you're not allowed to go to church. You'd say, oh, it's okay. I can pray at home. You see, this is the kind of pa- pattern, the kind of character that Daniel had. It says, Daniel went in and said every day he used to pray and open the windows. Now, he used to open the windows because he prays towards Jerusalem, which is the one God that he worshipped, but also for witness. And that same day, after he heard what they did behind his back, and they put that kind of edict, he opened the windows and prayed, as usual, three times per day. 
Now, I want to ask you a simple question today. The lion, the devil, Satan, the ruler of this kind of world, has done everything to keep you busy, to stay, keep you away from prayer. How is your prayer life? Do you pray three times per day? Do you pray three times per week? How often do you pray? How much time do you spend in personal prayer? Or do you leave it just for Sunday morning? How is your prayer life? Now remember, the prayer is the source of power. It's the time where you, as a child of God, you speak to your Father through Christ. It's a time where it's kind of a conversation between two loved ones. There needs to be time for daily devotions. At least once where you spend time with the Lord, how can you experience miracles without prayers, without fervent prayers? Do you pray? And I tell you, the, most, the thing that we talk most about is prayer in church. But the thing that we do the least is prayer. I'm reminded of John Wesley. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. A great man. I wish you can read his life. I love this man. John Wesley, to me, is like after the Apostle Paul, is one of the greatest people of the Reformation in the, in the 17th century in England. Now, John Wesley started as a young man from Oxford, and the Lord kind of put in his heart, and he, the Lord used him to start a great revival, which started Methodism and had a great impact later on on England and whole British Empire and then on the United States. But it's sad that he used to say, he always used to remind these people, and the way, the way they, by the way, this is why they call themselves Methodists, because they follow a method. They found the method, the most effective method, to kind of a win souls to Christ is prayer and fasting. So he used to say that there is, there is nothing that can happen under the sun without prayer. He says, God, when he wants to do something, he will put on the hearts of his children to pray. And then when they pray, the miracles would happen. And if you don't, are not part of this, you're not going to experience the supernatural work of the Lord. So he said, prayer. And before every revival, before every revival, they used to kind of, when he goes to these kind of cities, now remember, this is 1700 something, they used to go to kind of the stable and they would hold a prayer meeting. The next day when he speaks, People who have evil spirits or people from other kind of nominal background, they would come to beat him and fight him, but he would always win people to Christ. And one time, they decided to get rid of him. So he was in a stable that night before the revival the next day, and the group were just kind of gathering in together, and they were all fervently praying. And he said, oh, Lord, I pray for even those who oppose us that you will kind of touch their hearts and bring them to you, those who are going to be working against us, those who are come to beat us with the clubs. You pray, we pray for them. We pray for that person. And they started praying, and all of a sudden, a guy who had a little bag hiding there, ready to kill him. He was hiding and had a little thing over him himself. He sort of breaks it and comes out and says, please tell me how can I be saved. That same person was coming to murder him. When he heard their fervent prayers, repented, and came to know Christ through the fervent prayers of these great men, including Wesley. So the Lord is asking you to pray. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open to towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. He said, I've done it for 70 years. I will not change now. Luke, it says, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. You know, sometimes you pray for certain things and the opposite happens. But the Lord says, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Later on, you'll find out. Keep praying. Keep that daily devotion going on. I want to show you great miracles in your life. And I want to show you how I can transform the hard things, the terrible things that you think have happened to you into a blessing to, towards you and others. For after all of these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows all you need 
all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Lord says, and all of these things shall be added to you. Finally, the great decision that he did, he chose love over life. I love this. Now, we live in an era of hate. Look around you how much hate there is. You know, in this country, we think like, you know, everybody is happy and it's kind of a, we live in America and it's peaceful. But look at the hate. Look at what's happening in Ferguson and the hate, kind of racial hate that's going on. There's a lot of hate around us, even here. But look at the terrible hate that's happening in the Middle East. Look at these kind of incredible, incredible pictures that we show with the, with the, with the poor kind of uh, young man, James, um, uh, uh, James Foley. And that kind of monster, what kind of a monster was standing right next to him and trying to kind of a, basically behead him and ultimately beheading him? Look at the kind of monstrous thing that's happening. And then I, you know, I was looking at that person and, 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 and I thought that the kind of the, he had a British accent and I said, my, later on the report says this guy is a British guy. He lived in Britain, Great Britain all his life. What moved him to go there and just kind of a, just to kill and destroy? He's willing to put his life for the destruction and the death of others. And then the next day, the reports keep, kept coming in, and I just kind of, they were mind-boggling. They were mind-boggling. They just sort of drove me nuts, to be honest with you. They said that they, at least there are 500 British people who are joining ISIS alone. There is 12,000 in northern Syria from Europe and the West. They left there to fight with ISIS, to kill others, to destroy them. I said, why? I keep asking this question. I believe the Lord is asking this question. Why are people willing to give their life to the destruction of others? And very few people are willing to give their life to provide eternal life for others. But this man was unique. He chose love over life. He prophesied later on in the book of Daniel that someday the Messiah is going to be cut off and die for him. And he said, I've seen it through the eyes of prophecy. The God who is willing to die for me, who loved me unto death, I am willing to die for him. And he was willing to lay his life for his Savior and for his Lord. Are you willing to lay your life? Are you willing to live a sacrificial life? Look at the decision that he made. No greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his own life for his beloved. You are my beloved if you are do whatever I command. So the Lord says beautifully in Revelation, if you're faithful unto death, I shall give you the crown of life. This is how the early disciples saw the whole view, the whole thing. He died for us. He loved us unto death, the death of the cross. We will follow him unto death. Now, Tom, today, I'm maybe not asking you to go and sort of lay your life or go to the mission field, but I'm asking you to live here as a man or a woman on a mission for Christ, to live as a love servant. It's wonderful that Paul, when he calls himself, he says, I'm a child, I'm not a slave, but then he says, I'm a love servant because I've been captured, I'm the servant of Christ. And he captured my heart with his love. He changed me. And now not I should live, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who would live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the kind of person the Lord wants you to be. Whether you're young or middle age or old age, it's never too late to have him rekindle that spark and say, I want to live for you, Lord. I want to be a man or a woman on a mission. Now, remember, I want to just mention this last story. A person keeps coming to my mind every day, and I pray for her. Her name is, she's a surgeon. Her name is Amanda. She's in her 30s. She took her boards, 
She was an excellent trained physician in one of the best places. And then she looked at the map and she said, Lord, I would like to be a woman on a mission. And she looked at which is the darkest area in the whole world. And she looked in North Africa, one Arab country that very few people know about, called Mauritania. And she realized that this country has no people serving the Lord and preaching out to people. And then she said, uh, they told her, well, don't go to that place. It's the most dangerous part of the world. It's even dangerous than Iraq or Syria. Because Al-Qaeda found that there is one hospital which is Spanish, run by Spanish people. They were atheists, but they're just simply Spanish. They came in and butchered them so that there are no foreigners would be there. It's a very kind of a stronghold of the enemy. He said, Amanda, don't go there. She said, no, no, no. The Lord is leading me there. Where there is darkness, I want to show his light. She goes there almost three years ago. And then she goes to that hospital. They interview her. They take her. And now she's serving the Lord in that hospital. In the midst of danger, a woman living in the desert. We send her an email. She answers like three weeks later because usually there's no net. A woman called Amanda. She said, I'm a woman for Christ, a woman on a mission. I'd love you to meet her someday. Maybe next time you join us to the home conferences. She comes every home conference, and we feel it's our greatest privilege to stand with a woman called Amanda. But look, that same woman, Amanda, could be you. And that same man, David Thompson, could be you. The Lord is calling you to be a man and a woman on a great mission. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to renew our commitment to you this morning. There is nothing of a greater privilege in our life of greater worth than to love you and serve you. Remind, you reminded us this morning that the life that we live with you is a life of love, where we love you with all our soul and spirit and heart and will. And your love that is poured in our hearts through the Holy Spirit would bless us to experience your love and to make it known to others. So today we want to experience that love by submitting to you and dedicating our lives to you. Purify us, O Lord, one more time to live a holy life. Take control of our hearts. Shine through us. Teach us the meaning of the true spirit-filled and Christ-filled life that gives priority to prayer, priority to serving you, priority to your word. We pray all of this in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's continue to worship uh, our Lord with our offering, and we'll continue on worship here as well.
Mama John, could you pray over uh, the offering? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege today that we come here to be in your presence, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you make your presence known in each of our lives here today, both here at church and afterwards as we go out into the world. Lord, as we give you those little offerings of ours, they are a very, very small fraction of all the blessings you've given us. Lord, use these offerings to your glory, Lord. Use us, Lord, to your glory. As we go out today, remind us that all we need to do is to seek first your kingdom, and everything shall be given unto us afterwards. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful reminder today of that promise. I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful reminder of what great men and women did through you, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you will open up our minds and our hearts so we may live to the full potential that you have in mind for each and every one of us, Lord. As you dismiss us, Lord, today, ask us and remind us who our first love is. Grant us that we always remember it is you, Lord, and grant us that we fully live into that blessing. I thank you, Lord, for all that, and I ask for it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ.